Hello, this is Andy from the Engineers Academy and in this learning outcome we're going to be looking at some of the reasons why engineering materials and more specifically engineering components fail in service. And we're also going to look at some of the ways that these failures can be prevented or overcome. So to begin with, in this video tutorial, we're going to look at six common mechanisms or modes of failure, and these are all types of mechanical failure. We'll then go on to look at some other environmental and in-service failure mechanisms. So here we have six mechanisms of failure, overload, buckling, impact, creep, fatigue, and wear. And you're probably already familiar with some of these based on the work that you've already done in this unit. So some of what we look at here will serve as a recap of what we've already covered. So first of all, we have overload. Now during overload failure, the stress that the engineering material or component is being subjected to exceeds the failure stress of the material. Now there's a number of different reasons why this might occur. First of all, it might be because the material that we've selected isn't appropriate for the given application. And we've seen in an earlier outcome how we can select materials based on strength and other properties. Now this problem is likely to arise during the design process. So it's possible that when any design calculations have been carried out, they've not been done accurately or something's been overlooked. So as a result of improper calculations, the material that's selected for the application is not suitable for the application. Now, another reason why overload failures might occur is because of improper use of the component. And we have an example here on the right hand side. This is an information plate from an air receiver. And air receivers are used in pneumatic systems to store compressed air. Now, although it's a little difficult to see on here, we see two pressures indicated. We have a design pressure of 220 psi and we have a hydrostatic test pressure of 330 psi. Now what this means is that this air receiver is designed to work at 220 psi. It means that during normal working conditions, we should not induce a pressure higher than 220 psi on that pressure vessel. If we exceed that 220 psi, then that's improper use of the component. Now the reason why the vessel is tested to a higher pressure of 330 psi is to incorporate a safety factor. So if there's a malfunction of the equipment and the pressure rises from 220 psi to 330 psi, in theory, the vessel shouldn't fail. But the important thing here is the manufacturers are specifying not to exceed 220 psi and doing so may lead to overload failure. Now other reasons why overload failure may occur are flaws in the material or defects in the material. And in the previous outcome, we looked at some of the non-destructive testing mechanisms that can be used to detect things like flaws and defects in a given material or component. Now, finally, changes to the environment may cause overload failure. For example, if ambient temperatures rise significantly, then this can affect the properties of the material. Now, it's important to point out at this stage that many of these factors can cause all different types of failure. So as we go through some other modes of failure, consider some of these causes, things like inaccuracy of design, improper selection of materials, flaws and changes to environment, because these may also lead to other types of failure. So let's look at some specific examples. Here we have ductile and brittle fractures, and these are caused by tensile loads. So an example of overload failure would be failure due to tensile loading and different materials fail in different ways. We've seen this during UTS tests that we've done in previous units. When a material fails due to ductile fracture, so when we have a soft ductile material, what we see is necking at the center prior to failure. And necking is this reduction in cross-sectional area at the failure point here. Brittle fractures are slightly different. What we see during a brittle fracture is no necking in fact, we see very little plastic deformation before failure. And these two are represented on our graph here. So what we see for our ductile material is elastic deformation, plastic deformation or permanent deformation, necking and failure. And for our brittle material, we see elastic deformation, a very small amount of plastic deformation before this sudden failure. 
or brittle failure. On the left hand side we have test specimens from UTS tests and the most obvious example of ductile fracture is our brass in the centre here where we see significant elongation and we see necking and failure at the centre. And our best example of brittle fracture here is our bronze where we see a sudden fracture with very little necking. Now we can also get overload failure due to compression. So here we see examples of failure under compression where we have a brittle fracture on the left hand side or a sudden fracture with very little plastic deformation. And on the right hand side we see what would happen in the example of a ductile failure. So we see significant plastic deformation of the test piece. Now although this material may not rupture, it's obviously failed because it's no longer going to be fit for purpose. So there we have a number of different examples of overload failure due to tension and compression with both ductile and brittle failures. So our next mode of failure is called buckling. And buckling also occurs under compressive stresses in structural members. Now the important thing here is that the compressive stresses are not significant enough to cause the material to yield on their own. So this is a specific type of failure and it's specific to what we call long slender members. Now if you study the mechanical principles unit with us then we'll look at how we can calculate these failure stresses but the important thing to understand here is that a slender member is one that's long with relatively narrow cross section. And there's a way of calculating or determining how these are going to fail using something called the slenderness ratio. So structural members that are long with a narrow cross section are more likely to fail due to buckling. Whereas if they have a relatively large cross section relative to their length, then they're more likely to fail through the mode that we saw previously of overload. So what is buckling? Well, if we refer to our diagram here, we have a pin-ended structural member, and this is going to have a compressive force applied to it. Now, what's going to happen as a result of the compressive force and as a result of the slenderness of the member is that it's going to be unstable, and we're going to get this sideways deflection in the center. Now, just to give you a visual representation of what's happening here, if you were to hold a ruler on both ends between your hands and then push your hands together, then it's very difficult to apply an axial load without that ruler bending. And that's exactly what we see in the case of buckling. So we get this sideways deflection occurring, and now this compressive force is causing this member to bend rather than just subjecting it to compressive forces or compressive stresses. Now when this happens, we actually get bending stresses which exceed the failure stress of the material. So although the compressive stresses are not significant enough to cause failure, the bending stresses are significant enough to cause failure. And where this component on the right hand side would most likely fail is on the right hand side where it's under tension and it would fail due to the tensile stresses at this section here. So buckling of slender members causes bending, bending stresses exceed the failure stress and the component fails as a result. Next we have impact failure, and we know from our previous work that impact relates to the toughness of the material, and toughness is measured in joules per metre squared, or energy per unit area. Now a big difficulty with impact is that it's often unpredictable. Forces can change, velocity of impacting objects can change, cross-sectional area of impacting objects can change, We've also got parameters such as the impact time and the direction of impact that would all affect whether a component fails due to impact. So it's a very difficult area to analyse and understand. But let's take a look at some examples. Now the first type of impact is when an object collides with our component. And on the diagram on the right hand side we see three different scenarios and the reference point here is the velocity of this ballistic object. So here we have a spherical object which is making contact with our component. Now this component is going to be relatively soft and malleable and we can tell that by the type of deformation that occurs. So if this velocity is relatively small, then the projectile is going to embed into the material. 
So what we see here is that the impact energy is being absorbed because the velocity of our object is relatively low. Now for each of these examples, we're going to assume that the mass of the object and the cross-sectional area of the object are unchanged. But if the impact velocity changes, then the impact energy is going to change. Now if we increase that velocity, then we increase the energy of the object. And if we increase the energy of the object, we increase the likelihood that the material is going to fail. And in the second example, B, we see penetration. So in addition to the impact, the object is now embedded in the material. Now we could say that this object hasn't failed, but it hasn't ruptured. But in all likelihood, this would no longer be fit for service. It would need to be replaced or repaired. Now the third example is when the energy is greater, so the velocity here is greater. And what we see here is that the object or the projectile actually exits through the other side of our piece of material, causing a full rupture. Now we can see here that one of the properties of the material that would affect this is the shear strength, because what we have is a kind of shearing action where the plug is removed from the surface of the material. Now once again it's important to point out that this material would have to be relatively malleable, soft and ductile in order for this to occur. But let's look at another example with a more brittle material. So once again we have a projectile strike in the surface and with brittle fracture what we see is that cracks are going to propagate through the material. What we also have in this example is a supporting plate that's going to help to absorb the impact. The ceramic material or the brittle material is going to fail, but the supporting plate is going to prevent the projectile from exiting the other side and causing full rupture. So as the object collides, we get these micro fractures which ripple through the material. The other thing that's important to point out here is that this is actually increasing the cross section of the impact area. So we have our supporting plate at the bottom and now the impact force or the impact energy is being spread over a much greater area, meaning that the supporting plate is going to be able to absorb that impact. But nonetheless, what we see is that the cracks ripple through the material and cause instantaneous failure of the brittle or ceramic material. If we were to relate this to something like glass, then what we would expect on impact is that the glass would shatter and fragment. So there we have examples of objects colliding with components. And the important thing here is that the amount of energy per unit area supplied by the projectile is exceeding the toughness of the material to cause the failure. Now the other type of scenario to consider with impact is when the component itself collides with an object. And we see this in vehicles. We might see this in the testing of crash helmets and cycle helmets. Now when vehicles are crash tested, they're going to be crash tested at different velocities, they're going to be crash tested at different angles and different configurations in order to fully establish whether the vehicle is safe. Now once again, it's important to point out that what we're examining here is whether the material fails. And often with this type of impact, failure is built into the design of the component. So in a car as a prime example, at the front we have a crumple zone. Now what we can't change is the amount of impact energy that needs to be absorbed because the car needs to be taken from its given velocity to stationary. But what we can do is increase the impact time. And by increasing the impact time, we can decrease the impact force on the driver and passengers. So here the component is designed to fail. Obviously it's no longer going to be fit for service, but in failing it protects the individuals in the vehicle. The same would be true for cycle helmets and crash helmets. They would be designed to fail on impact, but in doing so, protect the skull of the wearer. Once a cycle helmet or crash helmet has been involved in an impact, it's no longer fit for use. It would need to be replaced. Now, another type of failure that we've seen in previous tutorials is failure due to creep. And another important thing to point out about creep is that the stresses are below the failure stress of the material. And the reason creep failure occurs is due to prolonged loading or extended exposure to stress. And we've spoken about this diagram on the right hand side previously. What we see is that when the component's first loaded at time zero, 
we get our instantaneous strain or our instantaneous change in length. But even though the stress remains unchanged, what we see over time is an increase in strain or an increase in elongation until the material eventually fails at rupture. Now, another thing that we spoke about is how that creep is temperature dependent. And we saw this diagram previously for a low carbon nickel alloy. And here we see that at any given stress, the time to rupture is dependent on the temperature. So if, for example, we took a stress of 80 megapascals, and we move right to the first diagonal line of 649 degrees C, we can see that the component will fail in roughly 10 to the 2 hours or 100 hours. But if we reduce the temperature, so again if we go from 80 megapascals, and this time we're going to reduce the temperature to 538 degrees C, so now we're sitting somewhere on this line here, when we reach the diagonal line for 538 degrees C, we can see that the component is going to fail in somewhere between 1,000 and 10,000 hours. So the reduction in temperature has had a massive impact in the time that the component can withstand creep rupture. Now in a later tutorial, we're going to look at how we can predict, based on any given temperature and any given stress, how long the material can last before rupture due to creep. Now another thing to consider in relation to creep is the impact that creep can have on other components. So here we see a gasket and this is probably carrying gas under pressure. Now each of these bolts is going to be responsible for carrying a certain amount of stress because the pressure in the pipe is going to be trying to separate the two flanges or gaskets of the pipe. Now if one or more of these bolts begin to creep or begin to plastically deform, then the stress on the neighbouring bolts is going to increase. So if this bolt, pictured in the centre here, slackens or loosens due to creep, then the bolts either side are going to have to pick up that slack. Now that might cause them to creep at a greater rate, which would have a knock-on impact on the other components. So when we consider the creeping of components, we need to consider what impact that's going to have on other components that are responsible for carrying the load. Now our fifth mode of failure is fatigue and again we've seen fatigue in previous tutorials and we've discussed how we can predict fatigue life or number of cycles to fatigue. Now the best way to think about fatigue is failure due to cyclic loading. We have another scenario where the stress or the stress amplitude can be lower than the failure stress of the material but the cyclic nature of loading where we have loading and unloading, loading and unloading eventually causes the material to fail. Now this might take a very small number of cycles, 10 to the 2 would be 100 cycles, or it might take a significant number of cycles, 10 to the 6 as an example would be a million, 10 to the 7 would be 10 million, and so on. So it's very much dependent on the size of the stress. The smaller the stress, the more cycles before failure, and the larger the stress, or the closer we get to the failure stress of the material, the less cycles the material can cope with before failure. At very low stresses, we have what we call the infinite life, where in effect the number of cycles is not limited. Now if we consider what actually happens during fatigue failure, there's a number of different stages. We have initiation, propagation and fracture. Now crack initiation is where the initial crack forms. And if we refer to the diagram in the top right hand corner, we see that we have a site of initial cracking. Now wherever that crack forms is going to weaken the material. In the diagram in the bottom right, we see that the origin is represented on the component here. And we'll see how that can be identified in a moment. The second stage of the process is crack propagation. Now remember that we're loading and unloading the component and we've already got an initial crack on the surface of the component. But by continually loading and unloading, we're going to increase the size of that crack. After any given number of cycles, a bit more of the material is going to fail. We continue loading and unloading, and another piece of the material fails. And the way that that's categorized when we look at the surface of the material is by these beach marks. Now in the bottom right hand corner, we can see those beach marks 
clearly located on the component and they radiate out away from our origin. So by following the beach marks, we can determine the origin of the crack. Now the final stage is rapid fracture. And rapid fracture will occur when the area of material that's still resisting the stress is sufficiently small such that the stress now equals the failure stress of the material. So in fatigue loading, the size of the cyclic force hasn't changed, but as a result of a reduction in cross-sectional area, force divided by area means that we have an increase in stress. This reduction in area means that the applied stress now equals the failure stress of the material, and at this stage it would only take one cycle for the material to fail. We see here indicated rapid fracture area, and on our component we can see the final fracture area here, where we have a kind of brittle fracture. So we have crack initiation here, we have crack propagation as we move through the beach marks, and then we have the final fracture here. Now the final mode of failure that we're going to discuss is erosion. And erosion occurs when we have surface to surface contact and movement. If you like, it's the rubbing of two surfaces against each other. Now there's two different types of wear to consider. One is what I would call necessary wear. And necessary wear is what might occur between a brake disc and a brake pad. The reason it's necessary wear is because what we're trying to do is we're trying to convert the kinetic energy due to the rotation of the wheel and the brake disc. And we need to convert that energy into friction so that the energy can be dissipated as heat. Remember that the goal here is to convert all of the kinetic energy to dissipated heat, causing the vehicle to stop. So in this case, wear can't be avoided, friction can't be avoided, because it's built into the design of the component. Obviously in this case, the goal wouldn't be to reduce the amount of friction, but what we would need to be wary of is that eventually the brake pads and potentially the brake disc would fail. Usually brake discs and brake pads would have what's called a discard thickness. So once the thickness of the brake pad is sufficiently low, it would need to be replaced. Now the other type of wear to consider is what I would call unnecessary wear. And unnecessary wear can affect efficiencies and performance of components. And long-term wear can actually cause seizing. Now one of the places where this would commonly occur is in gears and gear teeth. Now here we see an example of wear on the teeth of a gear or a sprocket. Now this particular type of wear is known as pitting, where as a result of the surface to surface movement, particles of the material actually break away. And it should be evident how this would potentially increase friction between the gear teeth, which would in turn affect the efficiency of the gearbox. Now another type of wear on gear teeth is known as scuffing. And here we have an example of scuffing, where we actually end up with deep scores on the gear teeth. And again, it should be evident how over time this is going to affect the performance of the gears, but can actually cause the gears to fail over time. All of this debris that's coming from the gear teeth is potentially going to cause additional wear and failure within the gearbox itself. Now, once there's sufficient wear to cause that gearbox to seize or to fail, the gearbox would either need to be reconditioned or replaced. So to summarise, we've looked at six different mechanical modes of failure. Overload, where the stress exceeds the failure stress of the material. Buckling, which occurs in long slender members, where they actually fail due to bending rather than axial loading. We've seen failure due to impact which can be quite unpredictable due to the many factors which affect the amount of impact energy. We've looked at failure due to creep or prolonged exposure to stresses. We've also looked at failure due to fatigue, which is caused by repeated cyclic loading and unloading of a component. And finally, we've seen wear, which is caused by the movement of two surfaces across each other.